Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to the Signum Symposium. This is our special symposium in celebration of the life of Christopher Tolkien. And I'm joined here, to, I'm Corey Olson, and I'm joined here today by uh, by several special guests. We have uh, uh, Sarah Brown, uh, who's a member of the Signum faculty, uh, who's joining us, John Garth, uh, who is, of course, author of, of uh, uh, Tolkien in the Great War and um, uh, just wrote the obituary for Christopher Tolkien uh, for The Guardian in the UK. Um, and uh, we're hoping to have also with us Brad Eden uh, from Valparaiso University. Uh, uh, but uh, he, he, we've been having a few connection issues, so but I think we should be able to bring Brad in by voice, though we won't be able to get him uh, on webcam with us. Let's see. Uh, Brad, are you able to, to hear and, uh, and see me here? Yes, can you hear me okay? We can, yes, very Great. good. So uh, I'm afraid, so you'll be sort of the ghost in the machine here uh, this, this afternoon, but we can at least uh, uh, get your contributions, which is great. Okay. Very good, very good. Um, okay. Uh, so thanks everybody for for joining us. Well, of course the 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 news of uh, uh, the death of Christopher Tolkien, uh, you know, broke some time ago, and this was you know something that I know uh, really hit a lot of Tolkien fans pretty hard. I, you know, in a lot of ways, this was um, for many sort of felt to be this. Um, the, the 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 severing of this living connection back to J.R.R. Tolkien. You know, Tolkien, of course, has been gone for a long time, and you know, many of us have. Uh, you know, we're not we're not even alive during his lifetime, um, but yet Christopher is still being there, and uh, you know, still manning the shop, and and uh, you know, doing all the work that he's been doing. I know was something that uh, kind of gave to a lot of people. Um, you know that 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 sense of a living connection back to uh, to his father and to his father's work, as if you know, in some sense, Tolkien's work was still going on in a way because you know because of Christopher's uh, close connection with um, uh, with all of that. So uh, so again, that's one of the reasons it seemed to me that Christopher's passing really seemed to hit a lot of people really hard. Um, and um, anyway, so. Today we just we're we're kind of gathering to uh, to sort of discuss Christopher Tolkien's contributions and and sort of celebrate the work that he did uh, over his life. Um, uh, first, any general reflections that uh, that you guys would like to offer? Any any sort of uh, thoughts that you have about about Christopher? And I, I wanted to talk about you know several of the different. I want to kind of divide Christopher's work up into you know different sections kind of looking at each one separately um but uh but first any general reflections you guys would like to offer i can offer a personal reflection if you like just to kick us off yeah um, sure in that um the closest i got really to having any form of connection with christopher was uh, when i applied to go and work with tolkien's own papers in the bodleian library when i was doing my phd of course it's mm -hmm. 17 degrees of separation in between the mini little academic and and Christopher but still when you go there and you call for your box you become very aware that he has curated this collection of work mm -hmm. that is available to us as academics mm -hmm. and um, I was immensely grateful to have the opportunity to actually see um, this work by his father that without uh, Christopher actually allowing that and putting that together and overseeing what was available what wasn't available mm -hmm. there wouldn't have been that collection there for us to work with it made a monumental difference to what I was doing with my thesis uh, and I remain incredibly grateful for that so that's just a, a little personal reflection there to, to start us off with it's true I mean yeah yeah I just, th there are a lot of people I think who and I, I've heard a lot of people over the years sort of grumbling about like what we don't have access to and the things that have been restricted and things like that. And I certainly understand, obviously, those kinds of thoughts. But yeah, it, uh, it's easy to take for granted all of the things that uh, have been made available, all of the, 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 the possibilities that are there because of the work that Christopher did. Absolutely. John, mm -hmm. sorry, you were going to say? I, I, that's what I was going to talk about. I mean, you know, never mind what um, you, you need to go to the Bodleian to look at if you consider what he's actually published. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's or, or, or what he's facilitated to be published. So 
you know, for example, um, Tolkien's papers on the, on the invented languages. Um, this is this is material, um, and with the history of Middle Earth, that will take, I think, generations to absorb, um, and massively enriches uh, what we understand about his father as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but what struck me um, when Christopher died uh, was. Well, the, the, sen- the sense of his connection with his father has grown on me slowly, and, this, and it became especially obvious to me when I started working on his obituary, um, that, that, that loss of a living connection. Uh, the thing that struck me was, was the, <laughs> the surprise and the frustration that he wasn't going to do any more work for us, which is an awful <laughs> selfish way of looking at things. Um, and, 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 you know, he's 95, but I, I posted a letter to him uh, on the eve of his death, um, asking for a further permission to look at some papers at the Bodley and for a, a research project he knew I was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, he would always very politely reply to my letters, apologetic, apologetically, always apologizing for having taken any time over, over, over replying. Um, very sweet letters asking about, you know, my, my personal circumstances and whether my family's okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I had a sense that um, this should never end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um he has be he has been such a uh, a fact of life in the tolkien community you know i mean it's uh it's uh it's like one of the he has really been not just sort of the 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 pillar but almost almost like the foundation of tolkien studies you know the mm. um the so much of his work is just you know the ground that we have all stood on almost almost like the oxygen we've breathed and without even really noticing as you know as uh, tony mead was saying uh, you know he says he's he's done talks where he had to remind people that a big part of the reason that so much of tolkien's work had to be published by christopher was because tolkien had a day job and family and simply wasn't able to and it's true that the extent that the, the work that tolkien did and the way in which christopher has spent you know, his entire career, essentially, um, working to make all of those things as available, you know, available and accessible and um, is is just, yeah, we have, um, uh, we have done so many things, you know, we have, there's so many things that, that, that we do, so many things we absolutely take, I mean, think how the extent to which we take the Silmarillion for granted mm. at this point, you know, um, uh, it's still really easy, you know. I, I find it it's it's increasingly easy if, even to forget almost um, at this you know remove of distance that you know the so without Christopher we wouldn't have the Silmarillion even you know mm-hmm. much less the other materials. It's um, uh, it has become I feel uh, a way just uh, of accepting that you know the Silmarillion is essentially one of Tolkien's publications, um, you know, sort of at this point now in retrospect, looking back on everything, people will think, you know, people will often talk now about Christopher's more recent publications, but, um, but again, some of that early work is, um, uh, is really, uh, is really, is really amazing. Um, yeah, Kate, I agree. Kate Neville says, you know, uh, 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 Christopher's death it was it's like uh it's like walking into Rivendell and finding Elrond gone you know mm. <laughs> and I, I think that's I think that's, that's I think a that's nice right. analogy it is yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> like no uh not no insult intended to Celeborn but it wasn't the same right <laughs> I mean <laughs> imagining people in the fourth age going to Rivendell and it's just yeah yeah not the same um no. Now, can you imagine Tolkien studies without everything that Christopher gave us? I just it imagine it, it, it is an incredible thing to contemplate, right? Just like the world of like pure speculation that we would still be living if we had nothing but the text of the Lord of the Ring and the append. I, I, I mean, imagine how precious the appendices would be and the mm-hmm. like amazing structures of speculation that would have been built. <laughs> on the slim foundation of the appendices alone trying to you know figure out uh, the, you know the, the 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 clues about the 
uh, you know, the, 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 the few linguistic clues that we get, you know, in the mm. appendices, the, uh, the sort of sketchy I, I suspect history. we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if, if it wasn't no. for Christopher. I don't think no. Tolkien studies would exist in the way it does. At Not all. in the way it does. Um, I don't think certainly. it could. I think no. there would be about a tenth of the, of the, of the work published that is now published. Yes. Um, and I'm not talking about work by Tolkien or, or, or Christopher's work, but every, all of our work, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, and, and, and in a sense, you know, my, my book came out of just some footnotes in in the Book of Lost Tales. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Um, uh, Brad, I, I haven't uh, uh, given you a chance here too. Is there anything you would like to uh, uh, jump in on just on these kinds of, uh, you know, sort of general thoughts and reflections to begin? Well, I, I think if you think about um, you know, the huge amount of work and um, background that Christopher gave us on on the process of um, writing and authorship of yes. probably the best known uh, 20th century author, uh, but that um, basically of almost any author of any time period that we have basically the entire creative process of much of an author's work, both from its inception in his mind all the way to its supposed of uh, finished or uh, many finished products, um, right. as we know with Tolkien. I mean, uh, without Christopher uh, to have that and to have that uh, filial link that many authors do, don't have and that devotion um, to uh, to his father's work and his father's background, um, you know, we there's just no other author in history that has the background that we have uh, for J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really wonderful point, and that's something I was reflecting on too um, when I was talking to the uh, New York Times people for their obituary. I was trying to emphasize this point. It really just kind of came home to me as I was as I was thinking that through, Brad, in exactly that way. It's not only that Christopher Tolkien's work provides us this, you know, uh, uh, amazing view into Tolkien's work that we would never have had. But we do have, I, I cannot think of any other author for whom we have this kind of information where we can really see the creative process. I feel that in studying the history of Middle Earth, I have learned more. Not that, you know, Tolkien is necessarily the ideal writer's role model that everyone should attempt to follow. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. <laughs> but nevertheless, like I, I feel like I have learned more about the creative process. There are more things that I have found um, by studying that, uh, which has been just revolutionary for me in my own thinking um, and even in, in, in my own writing and work. Um, it's, it's very, uh, it's, Altogether remarkable, I think, uh, and and something I think that is vastly underappreciated by the literary world as a whole. You know, I mean, I, that mm. that this kind of a profile of the writer at work, you know, this kind of an in-depth study of how the creative process unfolds for at least one, you know, brilliant, brilliant mind, um, is a kind of glimpse that it is, is extremely rare. There are a few other authors for which there is, you know, a great deal of published material, but I can't think of any uh, author for whom we have, you know, more than we have uh, of Tolkien. It's very, very remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you add on uh, the extra detail we get about his thinking and his writing process that we get via the letters as well, mm -hmm. you know, that gives another dimension to it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so one example there that w which has struck me lately is is looking at uh, the the letters included in in that between uh, the father and the son when mm -hmm. Christopher's in South Africa, um, and I think it's um, it, it, well, it, we know that the father that JRRT was sending off chapters of Book Four of Lord of the Rings to Christopher right. to read. Right. Um, uh, I understand from uh, Richard Ovenden, the uh, Bod Bodleian uh, chief librarian, um, that that Christopher's responses were detailed critiques, mm -hmm. um, and therefore you see that you get a growing sense that there was a, a kind of collaboration going on there. Yeah. And then in a, a, another sense, again, um, I firmly believe that by writing to his father about his own um, troubles as a as a an RAF trainee mm -hmm. um, 
he uh, elicited from his father memories of the First World War. You know, right. um, I, I went through this too, son. Um, uh, and I think that that very much goes into book four of the Lord of the Rings with the dead marshes and so on. Right, right, right. Mm. Yeah, so then in that way, both directly and indirectly, he was contributing to the to the creative process even during the first writing. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but it, of course, it began with The Hobbit, didn't it? You know, right. him saying, oh, no, but Bilbo's door was was blue last time. Now it's green. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, Dad. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, exactly. Fact checking uh, his father from a very early age. Yeah. Can, yeah. can, can I can I just read something that I, I noticed the sure. other day when I was, I was reading um, a C.S. Lewis um, uh, essay on three ways of writing for children, and this was this was published in 1952. So this was this was written at a time when Christopher, um, sorry, C.S. Lewis had come to know Christopher as an adult, mm -hmm. um, and he he talks of these three ways of writing to children for children uh, and then comes to this is the way of lewis carroll kenneth graham and tolkien the printed story grows out of the story told to a particular child with the living voice and perhaps extempore it resembles the first way because you're tr certainly trying to give that child what it wants but then you are dealing with a concrete person this child who of course differs from all other children you would become slightly different because you were talking to a child and the child would become slightly different because it was being talked to by an adult. A community, a composite personality is created and out of that, the story grows. So we know that Christopher, of course, was not the only Tolkien child to be told stories, but I think it's pretty clear that he was the one that responded most, most directly and, mm -hmm. and passionately to them. And it, it does sound, by using the singular there, that uh lewis was probably thinking of christopher specifically yeah. when he was mentioning tolkien there yeah yeah very good um carl hostetter the uh uh the 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 tolkien linguist is with us and 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 has a, a comment carl would you uh uh would you be able to to come on the mic if i opened up your mic and, and you can he has a, a a a quote from uh something that Christopher said about himself and his career in one of his last letters to Carl. And I thought it would, that would be really great uh, to share. So Carl, hang on a second. Let me uh, unmute you there. There we go. Well, hello everybody. Hi, Carl. It's, uh, I'm, I was really pleased to uh, see that you put this together. Um, it was a real blow to me. Mm -hmm. Christopher Tolkien was a huge part of my life. My life would have been completely different um if not for his work and his generosity and kindness absolutely uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be able to uh share this uh in one of his last letters to me he wrote um is it okay for me to read it yes please oh, okay uh he wrote um as i see it i have called myself a literary archaeologist i have never been more than a discoverer and interpreter of what i discovered my chief underlying purpose, I inclined to think, was to demonstrate the fullness and the richness of the narratives of the first age and to show that the Silmarillion was essential to the myth. One long saga of the jewels and the rings, my father said, I was resolved to treat them as one story, however they might be issued. End quote. So, as we see, Christopher really completed the, the one long story for us right right yeah that sense of um that sense of the the uh the incompleteness of his father's work right which so clearly drives the that initial work of getting the silmarillion out that sense that tolkien have of the head of the unity of the story and and that you know with the Lord of the Rings published, but not the Silmarillion published. The the thing was sort of truncated, right? The work was 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 unfinished uh, until that point. Um, that's a it's uh, interesting that he's the way that he was really emphasizing that 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 was his focus there. I also love uh, Carl his emphasis there uh, in the letter on discovery, right? On his role as 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 discoverer. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Which I think is is interesting, and of course, really interestingly parallel to Tolkien's own language about that, right? That's how Tolkien also often described himself, um, not as inventing, but but discovering things. Yeah. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, great. Well, Carl, actually, while we have you, um, uh, why don't you? Because I think that the 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 work that you know that that you guys are doing on the linguistic papers and stuff is is um, one of the elements I think not only of Tolkien's work but of but of Christopher's work that is pro you know I think probably least known by a lot of Tolkien fans. Um, could you just sort of talk a little bit about the way that you have been working with with Christopher and the kind of help that Christopher's been in the work that you guys have been doing? Uh, sure, I could talk about it a little bit. Um, he uh, it all it all started in the very very early '90s. Um, I first met him in '92 at the Oxford Centenary Conference, during which uh, he invited Christopher Gilson and um, Arden Smith, myself, and Patrick Wynn to take on the project of editing uh, and, and eventually publishing all of Tolkien's linguistic papers. Mm -hmm. And so that, that began the process. He would send us batches of photocopies of the manuscripts. Uh, this went on for many years, actually. It took um, to get it all into our hands. And uh, so and we've been you know, fo sort of following his example in, in terms of how we treat this material. Uh, the way we edit it and how we organize it and present it. And uh, it's an ongoing project and will be for quite some time, I expect. Some of us have full-time jobs, too. <laughs> so um, so, so, I, so under, I, I certainly can appreciate I, You know, I, I asked Priscilla once when I met her many years ago, only half-jokingly, did your father ever sleep? <laughs> because I had seen all, uh, virtually all the manuscripts that one can put one's hands on, um, and it's just it's in, it's massive. It's an incredible output. I don't yeah. know how one man wrote so much, <laughs> right? While still doing <laughs> another mm. full time job, as you say. Indeed. Yeah. Can I can I say something? Yeah, please. So so uh, Tolkien's uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's Times obituarist said that he had a Johnsonian horror of sleep, um, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, <laughs> and uh, but but one thing that really strikes me about Christopher is is yes, so so unlike the the rest of us, he did actually have the benefit, I think, of of some income from his father's work that um, perhaps from his own teaching pension too that supported him in some projects that were not going to be very profitable i mean i don't think the history of middle earth can for all the the, the amount the amount of effort producing it cannot have been the most profitable activity um uh unlike of course the film really and and um children of Hura and so on um but christopher also had something that was very that was that his di father did not have, and that was the um, the direction, the diligence to continue along one line methodically, yes. however hard and plodding it must have felt at times, um, uh, and not be distracted by by multiple projects as his father so often, mm -hmm. uh, very sadly, uh, was, yeah. by, whether by necessity or by personality or a combination. Right. Right. Certainly true. I mean, that is uh, the the way in which Christopher Tolkien followed through uh, is very remarkable. I mean, the history of Middle Earth is unbelievable as a series. I mean, as a mm. as a kind of single project, right? I mean, to undertake to say to produce the Silmarillion was one thing, right? But then to say um, no, no, I'm, I'm going to go through all of my father's creative writings, essentially, from the beginning to the end, from the earliest things we have of him through the last things he was writing in his, and I'm going to, I'm going to organize and I'm going to edit and I'm going to present these things in a sensible manner and annotate them. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing undertaking. And, you know, John, as you say, especially for a Tolkien, uh, amazing that he uh, followed that through as doggedly and diligently uh, as he did. And we certainly, um, uh, in that way, have been blessed by the ways in which he was unlike his father. <laughs> really, it's a, it's a good way of thinking about that. If and I might, I'd like to say one more, one more thing. Um, sure. Uh, had Tolkien lived to complete the Silmarillion, whatever that means, 
Right. Very likely we would never have had the history of Middle Earth. It is right. very likely that there's a great deal of his written work that we would never have seen, or maybe a handful of researchers. So in a way, it was kind of a good thing that he didn't finish it. <laughs> That's true. I'd never really thought about it in that way, yeah. but you're absolutely right. If not to to explain and sort of justify and and uh, uh, help everyone understand what the Silmarillion was and where it come from, came from, if it hadn't been for that challenge, for that um, uh, for that issue, then yes, uh, it's it's hard to see had the Silmarillion been finished in his in Tolkien's lifetime, Christopher saying, I'm going to like go through and, you know, publish and expose all of the early drafts and unfinished things that that dad wrote just like for on some principle, like, yeah, he probably would not have done that um, if there hadn't been the perceived need of, uh, you know, to explain the Silmarillion. Yeah, but John, you had wanted to say something as well. Sorry. To, yeah. Um, uh, although the history of Middle Earth looks and and is incredibly complex and it's not not an easy read right mm -hmm. um you know you end up juggling about five different books and, and fingers in the, the end notes and the, the yes. commentaries and whatever at the same time um i think it's actually deceptively simple yeah in the sense that the work that christopher had to put into producing that was much more vast than he actually shows. So the, yes. the work in establishing any one detail in there um, must have been quite significant. Um, and he actually, I, I think, all the way through un, underplays the effort involved. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder whether he had the most phenomenal card index ever or just, mm. um, as Richard Avondland told me, a, a, an absolutely formidable memory. Um, and then and then of course another unique thing perhaps is his ability to read his father's handwriting so oh, anyone who's tried goodness, to yes. puzzle through one of the tougher manuscripts um will know it's it's mm -hmm. really very very time consuming and and mm -hmm. christopher did that and he typed things out you know it typed vast amounts of writing out three-fingered right <laughs> could I, I i don't mean to hijack <laughs> no no please the webinar here but I did just want to put a little plug in um, there as I think it's now known it's been publicly announced that there's going to be um, a memorial volume for Christopher Tolkien mm -hmm. uh, published by the Bodleian mm -hmm. um, and I am contributing to that an essay um, where it's really more of a a mini handbook on how to edit Tolkien's manuscripts <laughs> which will illustrate <laughs> some of his very worst handwriting and the challenges <laughs> that, that uh, Christopher Tolkien faced, which it's, it's easy to fail to appreciate when you look at the printed text, right? Mm -hmm. how difficult this undertaking was. Right. Oh, that's mm, great. It's yeah, extraordinary. That's yeah, because if you look at, uh, you know, when you, when you work with his, uh, his notes in the Bodleian, and you know that he was using paper in the most conservative manner, because there wasn't that much spare. And so you get tiny little pieces of note paper and they are so tightly crossed. And then you turn it and there's a bit more going that way on this side <laughs> and then a bit on the diagonal down here. Yeah. Uh, and it can be, you can honestly sometimes just have a letter at the beginning and a letter at the end and what just looks like a squiggle in between. Um, mm -hmm. And I made judicious use of the big, monstrously big magnifying glass down there because my goodness it is not the easiest thing in the world to do uh, I mean, well, Christopher must just have been used to his father's <laughs> handwriting but that's more of an interpreting job than anything else I think my uh, colleagues and I distinguish um, the two worst stages of of uh, Tolkien's handwriting what the the second to the worst is where he starts using what we call the universal vowel which, uh, as you point out, is just a, a merest squiggle, indistinguishable from any other vowel. And then when he starts to use universal consonants, right. so that what you're left with is very like an EKG, and uh, you you really have to just rely on an aha moment to say, ah, that's what that says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or, or, the, or the next context. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or the next draft. Yeah. That's yeah. right. If, if one exists. Yes. Right. And this is, of course, again, thinking back to Christopher's commentaries in the history of Middle Earth. Um, 
when he hasn't overwritten one version of it in pen on top of another version written in pencil, as if one uh, uh, layer of writing <laughs> were not sufficiently complicated to try to to try to interpret. Tolkien himself couldn't read his handwriting sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be illustrating this too. There's passages where he's gone over at a um, later, later date and written written above the words what he thinks he wrote. And so <laughs> she can't figure it out. Or question mark. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, uh, Carl, I guess in part that comes back to your comment about the prodigious output. Right, that it it seems that this, the 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 terrible handwriting seems almost a necessary corollary, right? If somebody who produced that many, who hand wrote that many words, uh, you know, produced this much manuscript material, well, one of the corollaries is he must have been writing fairly quickly <laughs> while, oh, yes. while doing all these things. So it's kind he of it it with his pen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so yes, it's it does you know in some ways seems an inevitable part of the process, but certainly, uh, certainly a challenging element. And uh, and again, yes, I always appreciated Christopher's uh, not only his um, his his work in, in in interpretation, but in re reinterpretation. You know, I, I sort of love the moments in the history of Middle Earth when he, you know, sort of comes back in a later volume and says, you know, I. I now have, I think, a better reading of this. You know, when he's when he's you know, either found something which you know uh, uh, sheds new light on what that text might have been, or something like that. Um, I always uh, I always enjoy those moments. And, and he's also very honest about the limits of what he can say with confidence, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, and very honest about leaving questions open. I think that uh, I think that's tremendously important. And also I think something that uh, that used to frustrate me, but I, now I realize it was the only thing he could really do um, was that, you know, he, he refused really to draw his father's life. Yes. Outside biographical details into his study of the, yes. of the, of the texts. Um, and of course, because he knew his father very well, uh, that would have been gold dust for, for a biographer like me. Uh, yes. Nonetheless, it would have been uh, involved in a lot of detours. It would have it would have taken the edge off off a proper analytical study like this. Yes, yeah. The way in which he held himself um, as an editor in this sort of as object, you know, in in a fairly objective framework, you know, it's not that he's always completely objective, of course, about his father's work, but. Um, you know, uh, John, I always think about those passages, my favorite passages uh, with that kind of thing, with Christopher as editor, are the commentary that he's doing on the early poetry, like uh, You and Me in the Cottage of Lost Play, right? These poems, which are clearly very personal, even very intimate, right, between his father and his, father and his mother. Um, and it's, you know, the poem is doing nothing to conceal the biographical connection, right? I mean, it's explicit. And so therefore, since it's explicit, he doesn't avoid it. He doesn't deny it, but he's extremely shy about saying anything. And he, you know, and the way that the, the, the kind of, you know, uh, the kind of like looking down at the floor and like foot shuffling that he, that he <laughs> does during his editorial comments in those sections are just adorable. I, I, I always find them quite charming. Um, but, uh, you know, it's like the, the extreme example of him not uh, bringing in personal recollections, you know, because you can see how, although, as you say, John, you know, that those kinds of things would be just golden, you know, we, we would, there's so many ways we'd sort of like him to go off on a tangential recollection, you know, or tell an anecdote or something about, you know, his father's composition or like, I remember the time he and I were, you know, I was in South Africa and we had this heated exchange about this passage. And, you know, he could say, he could have said those things, right? And he doesn't ever, you know. I, really I, I wonder whether part of that, I think he was very, very cautious about memory and its reliability. Right. You know, he often says, I can't remember doing this, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it, when, whenever, whenever he had say typed out his father's works or whatever right. you know, i can't remember the details of the conversation um and again i think that's that's very honest he could so easily have have written what he thought happened you know right. without making it clear that, that there that there were limits mm, yes. or constructed yeah. a narrative that would at least fill the gap yeah right 
Right. Mm. Yeah. No. And so, he is. He, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. So this is Brad. Yes. Um, in, in, in talking about um, you know, Christopher's legacy on, on his father, I think, and this is one of the things I discussed in the panel when I talked about both Christopher as a medieval scholar, but also remember, remember that as a medievalist, um, both um, Tolkien himself and Christopher would have known um, the science of what was called hagiography, mm -hmm. uh, which is saints' lives. Right. When, we, when you think about the way that Christopher has managed and directed his father's legacy, both how we see him as an individual as well as as a writer, he has basically crafted it, the hagiography for his father, just like the medieval monks would have for uh, Guthak, Guthlak of Crowland mm -hmm. or for Bede uh, Venerable. Um, we have, because of Christopher's, Christopher's close background with his father, we basically have uh, his father's hagiography given to us through his legacy of his writings. Yes, although I'd also add that in some ways that tone, the hagiographic tone, um, is one of the things that he, I think, conspicuously omits from his, uh, from his editorial work, uh, especially. Um, we do get, uh, we are sort of able to, to sort of construct that. Um, but again, there was there was so much opportunity uh, for him to have done things otherwise, for him to have handled things differently than he did, right? Um, and we don't necessarily get a, you know, he's critical of his father. He points out his father's mistakes. You know, he um, uh, will say plainly when like he can make no sense of something and, and this doesn't seem to make any sense or, um, or you know when uh, uh, when when Tolkien's contradicted himself or something like that, um, and that's again that's he, you know there are things that he could he could have actively suppressed things he could have downplayed more, um, and I think I, his 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 honesty and his clear his clear attempt again not necessarily always successfully achieved but his attempt at objectivity I think is something that I always have found really admirable about his mm -hmm. work as editor. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tony, I agree. Tony Mead is saying he's uh, uh, he's honest about his unwillingness to overspeculate uh, outside of what is there in the text. Um, yes, I find him very conservative in that way as an editor. Um, think about the Silmarillion, right, and the work that he did in the Silmarillion. You know, what becomes clear after reading the history of Middle Earth is the extent to which Christopher prioritized. Um, not uh, prioritized adding the least amount of new material right you know he he could have done more he could have he could have there, there there are gaps that could have been filled in uh more aggressively there's you know the sort of the newer versions of things that didn't get finished which he could have just finished and added those in um but instead he you know contents himself with usually the smallest amount of Christopher Tolkien prose that can be inserted into the narrative and still, you know, sort of uh, leave it and and make it work. I think of those those few, uh, those sentences which sort of jump out at me as um, most, which strike me as most typical of the editorial work he did in the Silmarillion. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, uh, for example, of the sentence in the uh, about uh, Celebrimbor, when the like the one mention that Celebrimbor is given in the Quintus Silmarillion, um, when we're told that it was when when uh, 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 Curufin and Kelgorm are booted out of Nargothrond and Orodreth uh, uh, recovers the the kingship. Um, and there's that one sentence that says, at this time, Celebrimbor broke with his father and remained in Nargothrond. That was Christopher. Like, he admits he wrote that sentence, like, grudgingly wrote that sentence. And he inserted it because it was needed for continuity. Because, of course, Celebrimbor as a character didn't really emerge until after the texts he was working with in putting in patching those together for the Silmarillion. But he felt like there, there was a need to explain how Celebrimbor gets to where he is eventually placed, right, in Holland. How, why is Celebrimbor not wrapped up in the downfall of his father, Curufin, right? So 
he adds that one little stray sentence, which always kind of struck me as an interestingly, uh, it, it never felt quite consistent, right? With, um, uh, with the, uh, uh, the rest of the text there that sentence always kind of jumps out to me a little bit right as this sort of uh slightly sort of disembodied sentence uh so it was one of the ones i was least surprised to discover that that had been a christopher tolkien edition that he felt like he you know that information was needed there um but you know he didn't add he didn't you know add narrative he didn't he didn't you know he just did that one little thing and that kind of helped patch things together. And that seems to me to be fairly typical of his uh, editorial approach in the Silmarillion. Um, you know, so large a percentage of the text uh, is drawn from, you know, all of these different texts from various different, you know, spanning over 30 different years of, uh, of production. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, can, I, can I add yeah, something? Please. But but his role as an editor and selector of material was obviously um, enormous. Absolutely, and he did have that that terrible problem to deal with. Not not just the fact that there were there were different layers and that many of the texts were actually unfinished, but that his father, uh, late in life, had begun to dismantle the right. ideas that he had built and that was still right. at the core of of, of the earlier texts. Um, so the idea of the uh, the sun and the moon coming from the two trees, for example, um, right. and and Christopher, you know, clearly he could have um, ended up with something uh, either with multiple versions, um, admitting that the, this wasn't all finished, um, and making that bringing all that to the fore. Um, he could have come up with something that was much less poetic and beautiful than he did by selecting specifically from his father's later works where his father I think had, had begun to question so much the, the, the sheer poetry of the of the earlier stuff it was a kind of battle between poetry and philosophy almost wasn't it yeah um, so I think we've got to be grateful that, that he produced a Silmarillion that um, that held true to to uh, some kind of continuity of vision that lasted from the very beginnings until uh say the early to mid 50s yes yes and what a what a dilemma that must have been to i mean sort of imagining christopher undertaking the project right um of preparing the silmarillion for publication because uh, john you're absolutely right i mean in the last 10 years of his life the i mean the reason the silmarillion didn't get finished in tolkien's lifetime was that he had you know was in the middle progressively still of continuously changing so many things that he would have had to rewrite everything and rework so much of it you know almost from the ground up um and he never got around to doing that so here's christopher confronted with two choices right well probably more than two but at least two options right one of which was to uh continue the work that his father has just been doing right you know and he'd been working with his father so he knew at least many of the directions that Tolkien had been pushing things in, right? But if he had gone that path, he would have had to do a lot of the writing himself, you know? Like, so was he to pr try to produce creatively um, something which went in the direction that his father was trying to, to, to take adapting the earlier material, or was he going to essentially turn away from a lot of his father's later decisions and later impetuses for the narratives and use the much more full texts that he had, that his father had actually written from earlier on and find ways to patch them together. And of course we know he ended up choosing plan B. But I, I think that it's it's a really interesting testimony to his particular kind, to Christopher's particular kind of humility that he chose plan B instead of plan A, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I could imagine, especially, you know, John, thinking back to some of the things you were saying earlier about his uh his active collaborative role with his father right um one could have forgiven christopher if he had had a little bit more of a desire for the spotlight a little bit more you know urge to receive credit right <laughs> for for uh his role his participation in this work um 
you know, there have been uh, there have been many collaborators of that kind who, with less cause, right, less justification than Christopher, have wanted to come forward and say, "But I was a big part of that, right? A lot of a lot of the Lord of the Rings was really me, right? You know, <laughs> that would." how natural right would that impulse have been and for someone who had that kind of impulse uh you know who was you know would uh, succumbing to that kind of temptation how golden would have been the opportunity right to be like and now the silmarillion is before me right mm -hmm. it is down to me to produce the work that my father never uh you know i <laughs> right. shall place it the could capstone have been a brian herbert absolutely yeah. Ex absolutely to be brian herbert instead of christopher tolkien yes um but again that choice that he makes not to go in that direction but instead to say no i'm you know i'm instead going to sacrifice not only many of these later ideas of my father and these later changes that he had wanted to make but also sacrifice like his own personal shot shot at creative glory essentially you know to be viewed as a a real equal collaborator with his father creatively um I don't even know to what extent Christopher was tempted by that, if that was a, a temptation that even appealed to him. But um, I am sure there are many people who would have uh, not resisted uh, mm -hmm. that temptation. And again, just th that kind of humility uh, seems to me very characteristic of uh, the work that he did, you know, for this, you know, for these last 45 years, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Tony, you're right. There is actually a really interesting uh, paper to be written comparing and contrasting Brian Herbert and Christopher Tolkien. That would actually be, be kind of an interesting study, actually. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. The Sons of Giants and uh, how they how they how they work with their with their father's legacy. Um, one thing we haven't talked about too much uh, yet are is sort of what I think of as sort of the later generation of Christopher's publications. That is, you know, we have the Silmarillion, of course, being that the first move, right? The the first sort of imperative. Um, and then after the Silmarillion, we have this, you know, the, the series of more scholarly works, Unfinished Tales, of course, is sort of designed for public consumption and to answer many questions that people had. Um, but of course, the history of Middle-earth, a little bit less, popular in its appeal, right? Those works are not really designed uh, to be page turners to the general public, um, howsoever valuable they are. But then, of course, with the Children of Hurin, we have this new wave, right, of publications mm -hmm. in, in Christopher's later career of works um, which which are clearly intended uh, for a more public audience, which are which are designed to bring, you know, both bring forward some of his father's works, which had never been brought forward before, like the fall of Arthur, of course, and like some of the Beowulf material, um, uh, but also to package uh, the material, of course, much of it, most of it, almost all of it um, in the history of Middle-earth or unfinished tales already anyway, um, but really trying to, um, uh, to 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 take this one further step, it seems, uh, in protecting his father's legacy, right? In sort of establishing more clearly, I don't know if it's if if some of these later volumes. I'm thinking especially of Baron and Luthien and the Fall of Gondolin, um, uh, even less so than Children of Hurin, which is kind of a different project, right? In the Children of Hurin, he's putting the narrative in one contiguous form as it mm -hmm. never really had been because of the way it was presented in Unfinished Tales with gaps, you know read the Silmarillion for these pages, now come back and, and keep going, right? So it was never really presented in, in one single sort of novelized form. Um, but following that impulse, that impulse of, of presenting it to a wider public, um, you know, these later editions have, um, uh, have had a, a, really, um, a really profound impact. I mean, of course, as a, you know, as a, so for, for myself, you know, the fall of Gondolin and Baron and Luthien, of course, you know, needless to say, you know, I was personally sort of hoping beyond hope that there would be, you know, something that we hadn't gotten before, you know, uh, in those in those texts. And, and we didn't really get that. Um, uh, but again, that was clearly not 
the point, right? That was clearly not uh, what he was doing. And I have been really pleased to see, you know, and just in talking to Tolkien fans and meeting with Tolkien fans, um, hearing how much so many people have loved those volumes. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the those wonderful versions of the, like the, 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 the wonderful unfinished tales version of the fall of Gondolin, John, which I know was so important for you and your study. Uh, you did such great work with the fall of Gondolin material in Tolkien in the great war. Um, you know, that, that is something which I, it seems a lot of people have really discovered uh, for the first time through the fall of Gondolin. There's an audio book now too. So that's a, that's another dimension again, you know, mm -hmm. that, that really shows um, that, that, that it's reaching out to people who would not, have gone near the history of middle earth mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um so yeah that shift uh in uh in christopher's career when he he he, he you know sort of became at the end almost uh, it sounds trivializing to say a sort of publicist but that he the way in which he was really reaching out very concretely to uh to try to ensure that those those great tales right the stories that meant most to his father throughout his life um that those were being brought to as many uh to as many readers as possible that those were made as accessible as possible to as uh to as many people and i think that that's a that's a really though again still in the classic although it's with a different motivation from some of the earlier work still in a classic kind of christopher tolkien direction Right. I, I think um, actually that some of the, the the impression that you have now is is not quite the way the way it arose. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that that Christopher thought that I mean he said so, didn't he? That Baron and Luthien would be his last book, right. and that that was fundamentally important to him because it was inspired yes. by his parents' first yes. life. Um, and that having done that, and having done the children of Hurin pre previously, um, it it was. It was made clear to him that you know it would be a desirable thing and and, and eminently possible to do the same thing with the fall of Gondolin and therefore have mm -hmm. have a set of great tales you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was there was a touch of of the publicist there, but but Christopher was not the originator of that. Right. You know, he, however mm -hmm. much he might have understood and appreciated it, you know. Right. Although right. having having been told that uh, here is Beren and Luthien this is it now it's just right. the last thing and then announcing fall of gondolin on the 1st of april i think most people thought <laughs> maybe it's not going to happen so when it turned right. out to be a real thing it was quite a surprise to some of us <laughs> well, this I is, this is why i thought he might just keep on going forever because right. you know he said he said twice that he'd done his last book so why not mm -hmm. another one another last one <laughs> right <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, maybe, there's, maybe there's somebody who's going to curate what Christopher has left behind and we might still get something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's excellent. What are, um, and I know this is, uh, I, I'm not trying to uh, sort of probe deeply or uncover secrets here, but I know a question that a lot of people have is, what do we think happens next? You know, uh, what now is one of the big, you know, so the first reaction to Christopher's death is, um, you know, was that sort of emotional reaction, you know, that that sense of, you know, this, you know, uh, incomparably greater distance now feels like it has opened up between us and J.R.R. Tolkien, um, you know, this sort of upswell of appreciation for the, the, the often quite underrated work that Christopher did and things, but of course, Following all those things, you know, comes the inevitable question, which I've already been asked many times by people: What happens now? You know, mm -hmm. uh, Christopher has been such a fact of life, you know, such a uh, 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 such a dominant figure uh, in Tolkien studies and the Tolkien estate. Um, what what now? You know, lies in the future. What do we? You know. Uh, what do we what do we think is going to happen and as i say i'm not i'm not trying to probe for any uh for any secrets here but any thoughts that anyone has on on uh what tolkien studies after christopher uh might look like or the tolkien estate after christopher i'd be very wary of guessing frankly and, and uh, i ask the same question 
Yeah, I, I, I just don't know. I, I assume that a great deal of thought was put into it while Christopher was alive. Yes, um, and that therefore some something has been um, put in place. We, you know, the the Tolkien estate was not just Christopher. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, there were there were um, board members on the on the Tolkien Trust um, who, who can collectively make decisions. Um, of course, they 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 will now lack that. Um, you know, vivid and personally close living connection with J.R.R. Mm -hmm. Tolkien that they have. Mm -hmm. um, so the decisions will, will will not be informed in the same way. Um, but yes, they'll have to be made somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we can only assume that um, he would have made his wishes clear to that board while he was still alive, because I can't imagine him leaving it to chance in any way. That doesn't no, sound like I can't either. Thing. I can't either. And then, you know, yeah, I, I mean, my, my primary answer to this question when I've been asked also is I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, one thing, though, that I would say I would be surprised by, you know, there, are, uh, there have been people, you know, a lot of people that I have spoken to who have, Christopher received uh, a lot of attention for his uh, negative views on the films mm -hmm. back in the day, right? And his resistance to the film adaptation, or at least his perceived resistance to the film adaptation. Um, and a lot of that, especially in people who have been very big fans of the films, a lot of that, I think, has led to this sort of subculture among uh, some Tolkien fans uh, that, that kind of believe that, you know, Christopher was this um, sort of dampening force, right, um, that prevented a lot of these things. The dragon and, sitting on the horde, that kind of exactly, thing. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. And that, therefore, there is some... Um, a kind of expectation that, um, you know, with his death, now all of a sudden things are going to change, right? You know, there's 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 going to be a, a, a revolution uh, in uh, the policies mm -hmm. of the Tolkien state, and we're going to see a radical change. I, I, I think if there's change, it's going to be slow. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so too. And, yeah, right. I think it's a radical change. I'm very skeptical uh, that anything like that is going to happen. I, so I, I, I really cannot imagine um, that at the Tolkien estate, you know, they've been all kind of waiting for Christopher to die. And the moment he dies, yeah, they let's fling you know, open these boxes and exactly. here we go. Yeah, I can't imagine yeah, that. No, I think, I think there'll be caution. There'll be a great deal of respect for what Christopher would have wanted um, yes. in the same way that, that there's been respect for what Gerard T would have wanted, right. you know. Right. Absolutely. I, this is Carl, if I could yeah. add a little something here. Sure, uh, yeah. So we, Christopher, of course, departed the board of the Tolkien right. estate before his death. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that many of these details we're wondering about had been worked out well in advance. Yes. The change that it's being referred to, well, we've already seen a bit of that, I think, um, with the Amazon deal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't imagine Christopher was very happy or involved with that <laughs> um but he i think he bowed to it as an inevitability um mm -hmm. and then i would also just add that we know the makeup of the board now and it includes bailey tolkien christopher's wife mm -hmm. it includes uh, priscilla um right. and it also includes kathleen blackburn who has been mm -hmm. very working very close with christopher for many years now Yes. And um, I'm sure that the, the three of them, at least, will continue to guide things as Christopher would have wished, to yes. the extent that they know that. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, that would make sense. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Very good. Well, uh, any any final thoughts or reflections, people? I know we're, we're coming up on our, on our hour here, uh, and I, I don't want to... Uh, keep people on this. I'd also ask any any final questions uh, from members of our audience would want to uh, would want to ask the panel. Um, but first, any 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 final thoughts from from any of you? 
I, I just wanted to mention his. There's a, there's a line that always sticks in my mind from from um, one of his faxes to me when I was writing uh, Tolkien and the Great War, um, because that's how we communicated. And he was uh, again apologising for for some late message, um, and he said that he lived in a region of France. Um, uh, noted for thunderstorms fatal to faxes and i thought <laughs> you know he thinks in anglo-saxon alliterative verse even when he's talking about fax fax machines um and, and there was something there there's just this kind of charm to his his pers personality that i think um uh you know doesn't necessarily come across in in his published writings but um is it, it was really quite quite something <laughs> that's pretty awesome Fatal to faxes. I like that. So, I, if I could, I just to, to uh, share my final thoughts. Um, this is something I wrote. It was still quite fresh news at the time, um, but I, 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 it's still true. Um, Christopher has been widely quoted as saying, "As strange as it may seem, I grew up in the world he created." His father. For me, the, the cities of the Silmarillion are more real than Babylon. And then I add, this is no exaggeration, it is precisely true. And so we must note and may duly mourn the passing of the last inhabitant of Middle Earth. Mm -hmm. And I, that's how I think we'll always think of him. Right, right. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, we've lost that immediate bridge to Tolkien. Um, that, you know, that connection that, that made Tolkien feel, well, for me, like he was still very much here because we kept getting all this extra stuff through Christopher uh, and, and it provided that bridge between us and his father. And yeah, it does feel a little bit lost now with yeah. that question of what, what happens now? What happens next? How does it work now? Yeah, so I think of uh, I think of you know Ariel in the Book of Lost Tales, right? The one who the one who brought the book back, you know, to the uh, to the uh, to the to the world of men, and and Christopher has been like that over the yeah. last, you know, over the last several uh, decades. And and sorry, you're you're right. I mean, the um, <clears throat> even trying to you know occasionally uh, people that I you know friends and family who are not Tolkien people would be like so i heard that the tolkien published a new book recently what the heck <laughs> like how is that even possible <laughs> didn't he die a oh, long God time ago <laughs> right exactly and again and, and but that was christopher right that was that was what mm. christopher meant you know christopher and and so in that sense sarah it, it was like you know it was almost like uh tolkien was still with us you know mm. because we we were still getting new publications from from J.R.R. tolkien you know 40 years after his death and um and and yeah, so now that uh, that 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 connection is is now gone. You know, we're not we're not going to get that anymore. We're not going to get uh, uh, many more monographs uh, under the J.R.R. Tolkien byline anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, now that Christopher is gone, uh, I, I, and yet that now leaves us the space to start really appreciating his work. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and again, he's been. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is quite fair to say, but I I, uh, I have sometimes felt that Christopher Tolkien, like over you know, prior to his death, uh, has that I, an uncomfortable percentage of the time Christopher Tolkien has been brought up. It has been to complain about him or something that he has done in one way or another, either to you know to criticize the Silmarillion, oh like you know I, I dislike some of the choices that he made in the Silmarillion, or to uh, to complain about his gatekeeping function and and uh, uh, and you know are not allowing access to things or things like that. Um, and I certainly uh, am. It is it is something certainly that I am hoping that we can kind of enter into now is a, a period of much more um uh much more positive reflection and appreciation for uh for what he did which is absolutely uh amazing yeah as tom hillman says publishing apparently lies beyond the circles of the world yes yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly yeah, very good 
Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you uh, to our uh, to our our panelists, Sarah Brown and and John Garth and and Brad thank Eden you. and Carl Hostetter for joining us uh, spontaneously. Really appreciate that, Carl. Glad you could join us. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank well, you for having me. Yes, very good. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, with the Signum Symposium series, we'll be back with uh, uh, with more topics for discussion uh, in uh, over the next few weeks and months. So thanks very much, everybody. Bye now.